um, welcome to Beaches Watch, which is a community organization. We're a 501c3, and we try a 501c4. Oh, sorry, 501c4. And what we try to do is bring to the communities, the beaches, the three beaches communities, um, interesting speakers and people who have an effect on you. Um, we do a, we've had the mayor here, we've had the police chiefs, we've had uh, school board, superintendent, all kinds of great things. Um, tonight, of course, as you know, you came to hear our state senator and our state representative. I first want to make a little plug for our Beaches Watch. The best deal going, $15, and if you join now, you get an extra two months because your membership goes all the way to December 2024. And I know some of my friends are looking for one way to save a buck. So, there's, there's my uh, advice to you. So, we do several things. One of the things we do with the money, because nobody gets paid at this, we just show up and do the work. And I put those chairs out. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, but we give away a scholarship every year to a, a senior at Fletcher High School. And we also do a give back donation of between $500 and maybe $800 to a 501c3, right, Sandy? <laughs> and uh, so if you have a f favorite 501c3 that you would like uh, to nominate, be sure and let us know about that. Okay? Next. Uh, okay, so. All right, so we talked about membership. I wanted to recognize first, one of the more important people here, is we have someone from the Neptune Beach Police Department. Just to keep you... <laughs> it's not just because my Rocky friends came from Fleet Landing. We talked about Tom. Um, but anyway, and then we have with us uh, Jessica, Jessica Ring, Jessica, where are you? Stand up. She is an Atlantic Beach City Commissioner, and we have, we have Candace Kelly, who is also an Atlantic Beach City Commissioner. And then we have one of my board meetings, our board meetings here for Beaches Watch, who also is a city commissioner in Jack's Beach, Sandy Golding. <laughs> uh, so, we do have, um, if you want to do the online nomination for that, you can stop me in currents and I'll get back. <laughs> Those of you that live with me. Alright, now. Okay. Um, in December, our meeting, we always meet on the first Wednesday of every month at 7 o'clock here at the Third Street Library. And we try to do it sort of like a rotary meeting, start at 7, finish at 8. So uh, do join us. We will be doing our uh, presentation um, about our 501c3. So, we'll be happy to have you join us. Um, I know how most of you heard about it, so I'm not going to ask that question. But if you want to tell us, if you didn't come because Jackie stood up in a meeting and invited you, uh, then you can tell Kevin on the way out. Uh, now, here we are, and I'm just going to let them do the introductions. Some of us, at Fleet Landing have already had the pleasure of uh, knowing and listening to our state senator. But I warned him that since the last time he came, we had some catastrophic news. 
Uh, and so um, I said, they came out to hear you again. So please welcome State Senator Clay Yarborough. from the beaches area. You know Clay had told us when he came, he not only does the beaches, he also does Nassau County and sort of the whole donut hole of Jacksonville with the except or Duval County, with the exception of sort of the middle city part. But our state representative, Dion Michael, only has the beaches. So she is our representative <laughs> let you two introduce yourself and go. We will stop at 20 minutes of because there's some questions. Oh, you need to have that on. Yeah. Are you okay? Hello. Hello. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to stand just for a minute here. Um, there, now I can see everybody in the back too. Okay, great. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Um, and thank you for not asking. Uh, my, Rick Michael probably could, but thanks for not asking us to play the piano or yes. sing or dance or anything like that. That would be uh, probably... The evening's young. The evening's young. Okay. <laughs> probably torture for everybody. Um, well, thank you, though. Uh, Clay Yarbrough, your state senator for State Senate District 4. And I uh, just want to say how uh, very thankful and honored I am to be with you tonight. I know uh, at a meeting earlier this year, Representative Michael was with you, but I was unable to for those who might have been here uh, at that time. And it's great to see so many familiar faces from Fleet Landing. I was so, uh, so happy to be out there with you within the past month to speak to uh, a lot of great folks out there. And it's great to see you again. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to come tonight, come tonight and share with you about some of the issues that we're working on and uh, that we have worked on, that we plan to work on, and, and all that good stuff. So it's great to be with you. And I wanted to mention my all-star legislative aide, David Pavia, is with me tonight as well. And uh, we look forward to a uh, good evening. So thank you very much. Well, hello. <laughs> you all look beautiful. <laughs> My name is uh, Kyle Michael, and I am honored to represent everyone that's in here if you live at the beaches. But I, I also represent the other side of the intercoastal uh, portion of East Arlington. And it's kind of dagger uh, cut, so it's an odd. Let me hold it close. I remember you told me this. She's the boss, so you know, I got to follow what she says. I want to make sure everyone can hear. Uh, it's an odd uh, way that the district is, is cut in shape, but it goes somewhere towards uh, JTB. And so I have Jacksonville, Neptune, and Atlantic, Mayport Naval Station. I'm honored. Do we have any veterans that are here? If you can just. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service and your families, for your sacrifices. My husband, somewhere there, is a retired uh, military veteran, so I'm, I'm very much uh, in tune to what's going on at the base. And wow, it's an honor to be born and raised here and never knowing that I was going to run for office and, and to come full circle. And I have the honor of also representing the Mayport Naval Base. But thank you for having us. And I just want to mention um, one thing is that I, my staff, Destiny Davis, she is my legislative aide, and brand new Kathy Posey is the district aide. And we, all three of us, we represent as well as the senator staff and the senator, we are here to serve you. We represent you all. Uh, I think on Sunday, Destiny and I will be uh, leaving for Tallahassee for committee week. Okay. You know, they have a bait over there on the city side. Oh, you do, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we will be in Tallahassee, I think, for two weeks next week. But we're blessed because in the district, we also have people that serve and that will be sit, sitting in that office that will be Kathy. So if you need anything while we're in Tallahassee, you can still reach us through Destiny. 
but Kathy will be right here at the district and the same will be sure with your, with your office. We don't leave you guys uncovered and unrepresented. I just want to say this one last thing before we get started. Is in the back of the room on the table, you'll see these yellow cards and if we don't get to whatever your concerns or issues are and you'd like to express them, please stop and fill out one of these cards. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. And uh, my, my office will make sure that they pick them up and they'll get to me and I get to read them and they get to read them when we get to respond. And that's it. Thank you so much. So thank you, Representative Michael. I, I have to say too that uh, I couldn't ask for a uh, better partner in this process than Representative Michael. Um, she is doing a phenomenal job for us in Tallahassee. Uh, in the House, and uh, she, she was saying a minute ago, oh, we haven't made it in the Senate. Well, you know, the, 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 the Senate's kind of a library, the House is more of a carnival sometimes, so it's kind of an interesting <laughs> mix over there, so there's fewer, fewer in the Senate, but I served in the House for six years before going to the Senate. Um, what we want to do, just kind of break the ice a little bit, is uh, see how up everybody is on their Florida trivia. So we're going to get into this a little bit. It is multiple choice, so everybody's got a good sporting chance. I'm sorry we didn't bring a bag of candy or anything for right answers, but we'll still have a little bit of fun with it, just for a minute or two before we go into some issues. So David, go ahead with the first question here. Let's see what we have. Uh, Tallahassee is the largest city in what informal region of the Panhandle, which stretches from the Apalachicola River to the St. Johns River, and which shares its name with the Texas National Park on the Rio Grande? Choices are Appalachian Bay, the Big Bend, Gulf Shores, or Steenhatchee Bay. The, the votes are in, and it's Big Bend? Yes, Big Bend. Okay. All right, next. Biscayne, San Marco, and Delito are artificial islands in Miami that are collectively known by what name in reference to another city with significant water features. Normandy Isles, North Bay Village, Venetian Islands, or Sunny Isles. I'm hearing a lot of Venetian Islands. That's correct. Has anybody visited down there? Do you know where it is? South Florida? Nope. Okay. Well, okay, we have one. Okay, three. Located south of Tampa, what Florida city is home to the Bishop Planetarium and the Parker Manatee Aquarium? Is that Bradenton, Port Charlotte, Sarasota, or Venice? Okay, we got some mixed ones on that. It's actually great. Yep, that's where that one is. This one was probably easy. Which city in Central Florida goes to the North Florida Strike Okay, just go ahead and have that. No, 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 no. It's pretty easy. All right. Now, this was interesting to me. I just learned this earlier this year. Florida has the lowest, highest point of all 50 states, which is called Britain Hill, located in Walton County over the Panhandle. How high above sea level is Florida's highest point? Is it 35 feet, 205 feet, 345, or 615? 35. Did you look at my notes before the program? <laughs> you climbed it. Okay, thank you, Wendy. She's climbed it before, she said. Okay, we'll give you a prize for that 345 feet, that's our highest point in, uh, in Florida. Now, all right, what is the coldest Florida temperature ever recorded? And it's definitely a lot lower than it is right now outside. Minus three, zero, minus two, or one. Okay, yep. Minus two. You see when this was? February 13, 1899. I guess the legislature might have had a session on that. Minus two in Tallahassee. But they got warm from Miami down there with the Venetian Idols, right? They got 90 degrees down there. They probably didn't know what to do. Uh, minus two in uh, Jacksonville had about 10 degrees, I think it said. So. All right, that's okay. Yeah, 10. Florida's coastline is the longest in the contiguous United States with how many miles? 16 to 25, 11, 25, 13, 15, or 9, 50? All right, go ahead. 13, 50. And then the map over there I thought was kind of neat. We just threw that one up to show kind of the different names of coasts that we have along Florida, some of the informal names that are given, or official names. Thirteen hundred and fifty miles around the state. We have one more data. Oh, that was it. Okay, great. Thanks for playing, everybody. Give you a little more history and then uh, kick it off in that way. So, um, I'll Rev, if you're okay, I'll start with the first slide, and we'll just go back and forth. Um, what we wanted to do was uh, just mention a couple of appropriations that we funded in the current year, and we'll talk about some that we're looking at for the for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, the state's fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. 
uh, each calendar year, and that's um, typically new laws go into effect, go into effect, excuse me, July 1st of each year. Some go into effect in October. Some may wait till the beginning of the calendar year. It just depends on what the policy is. But the budget always goes into effect uh, July 1st of every year. So two of the projects that Representative Michael and I worked on that are now funded in the current fiscal year budget, uh, one was for Atlantic Beach, the Aquatic Gardens, Hopkins Creek Flood Mitigation, uh, part of that project at $500,000, and the Jacksonville Beach uh, Water Treatment and Pollution Control Plan uh, chlorine conversions. We also were successful, thankfully, at uh, getting that in the budget as well. So uh, I have to say uh, also, and I'm sure the rep will join me, uh, not only the council members and commissioners who are here this evening, but even those who aren't here, they work incredibly hard. I know all of you know this who live at the beach. They work very, very hard. Uh, we just met with my, my uh, David and I met today with uh, Mayor Brown here in Neptune Beach about a project that we're trying to do for the coming year. They're all working very, very hard on your behalf. So I uh, can't stress that enough. And they have brought these projects to us and made it very easy for us to just walk it right in and hand it to our budget folks and put it down. It's not always easy to get the money funded in the budget. That's where we have to do our part and push it. But they make it very easy here on the ground to do all that work, give it to us and give us all the information we need to know to try to help all of you out here at the beaches. So I wanted to make sure I said that and that you know that, but I'm sure you already do. Um, so those were two that we uh, were able to fund in the current year. And then uh, on the next slide, David, I think, and Rabbi, I'm turning to you if you want to cover uh, these that we're looking at doing uh, coming up. You sure? Thank you. I'm going to do this whole thing. This is a team thing. Okay. All right, well, I'll talk, I'll talk just for a second about these two and, and certainly welcome the Rabbi chime in. But uh, here's four that we're looking at for the coming fiscal year. Uh, two for Atlantic Beach, septic tank elimination for Atlantic Beach, helping out with that project, that's $250,000. Uh, Atlantic Beach critical new walkovers, $500,000. The Neptune Beach project that I mentioned today is uh, requested $2.3 million. And then Jacksonville Beach Golf Course beneficial reuse retrofit. And we put the, the note on there to comply with state law. A couple of years ago, there was a Senate bill that was passed and put on by the House and the Senate, but it uh, went into a lot of the regulations related to reclaimed water and standards that have to be met across the state uh, by a certain date in the future. And so it may seem like, well, why is it just the golf course and all of that? Um, it's for the benefit of the whole community, but it's also so that Jacksonville Beach can be in compliance with new laws that have been put in place. So it's not just like, oh, it's only benefiting the why is it just the golf course or something like that? It's because they have to come into compliance with state law and not be in violation. So we're going to help them out or seek to help them out with $500,000 on that project. And I took a drive with our great staff in Neptune Beach today. Uh, David and I did. And the reason that one is so high is because if anybody's familiar, the, uh, the water, Neptune is basically processing water that's not only their own, but also from Atlantic and Jack's Beach as well. Uh, for those who may not be familiar. And so we took a drive around today, looked at the culverts, looked at the waterway, and basically followed it all the way from north to south, uh, driving through the community past Jarbo Park and past some other areas over there, uh, and took a look at it. And it's, you know, we haven't had rain lately, but that, that water, we're at high tide, I guess, today or this afternoon, uh, that water level was about to crest the top of some of those areas that we saw today. And they're watching all of that, doing what they can to mitigate it and to fill in some areas. Uh, but it's, it's a, a, a big need, so that's the reason for the big price tag uh, on that one. So we're going to make a push and do what we can to try to get that uh, funded. Um, if anybody has, well, I guess we'll do Q&A again. I was going to say if anybody has any questions. There's not really a ton more detail than really the title. I mean, that kind of gives you, you know, what the information on what it is. But uh, these are the biggest projects that the cities have brought to us uh, out here. And, and, and again, we just want to do what we can to help. So that's why we've, uh, why we've engaged in those. Okay, I'll uh, turn it over to Rep. Michael just for a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Senator. And, and he is awesome to work with. He really is. And they do have an easy term. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, I go over on the Senate side for sanity because it literally is like a circus in the house because we're all just going. I mean, we are. What you see, if you ever watch the Florida Channel, that is so real. We are a clash here. We're going at it. We're going to war. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. So I'll go over to the Senate side immediately. The carpet color changes. <laughs> and it's like, it's like the library. And I'm like, wow, I'm not going over here. You know, and they always know who we are. So I, I can't stay for long. So after a few minutes, 
I head back over to the circus, enjoy my dinner. And, um, but it is an honor, I say that and, and I'm just joking, but it really is very, very busy. It's a very, I don't know what you guys do. I don't know, I guess you all just, you fight different. <laughs> it's not as many, it's not as many, I, you know? But on our side, I'm telling you, we're all roused up, we're hanging from the ceiling, we're just going. Uh, I wanted to add with Mainport, um, I do stay in touch and meet with the uh, commander, with the captain of Mainport Naval Base. And for the veterans that are here in the room, and if, if you have children that are serving, um, because the residents are part of our concern as well. And one of the things that he brought up, or one of the major things, was just making sure that uh, the educational bills that are passing uh, in the state level, that the Mayport school children are eligible uh, to have those benefits. And one of the uh, challenges that they were facing is that when they move here from out of state, um, if they have to leave, and, and they do, you do every three or four years, there's a rotation, is coming back into uh, this district and maintaining their space so that their children don't lose the school that they're at. They love, they love the fact that they are able to choose which schools their children are able to go to. And so I just wanted to mention that, that that's something I'm working on. Um, I'll be working on it with the Speaker of the House and with our leadership there. And I haven't even mentioned it to you yet. <laughs> and I'll bring it to you. Um, these are some topic, uh, topic of interest, as you all know. We hear it so much. And um, at Vacation and Rentals. We hear all of the problems with the vacation rentals. We sat down with all the mayors. I know my office has, the senator's office has, um, and it's, it's just trying to come up with solutions. So if you have ideas, please fill that out. But I do want to say, and I want to emphasize that we are working as hard as we can and as diligently as we can in the House and on the Senate side, I'm sure you will say, uh, to come up and, and try and make sure that you all are covered and that you maintain the control over your own area. We're not trying to control you at the state level. Um, we hear you. We know that that is uh, one of your concerns. But we also are aware of the violence that comes with the vacation rentals and how it is brought up the crime rate. Um, and that really touches me and bothers me. And I'm sure it bothers the center as well. I don't want to speak for them, but we do hear that and we're trying to, to work with the other representatives. The last session, there was a, a couple of bills. Can you hear me? Okay. There's nothing worse than you're, someone's talking and you can't hear them. So let me know if you can't, just wave at me. I know the last session, there were a couple of bills that came out uh, regarding vacation rentals and I heard from the mayors. And this is where the relationships are so key because uh, you speaking to your mayors and letting them know how you feel, what you think. They may not be able to represent every voice, but they take the consensus, I'm sure, of that and they relay that back to us. And I'm walking into the chamber and I hear Representative Michael, Representative Michael, and I'm all into my whatever I'm, I'm focusing on. And I turn around and they're saying, She's like, vote me down on that bill. <laughs> it was about my kitchen riddles. I said, I got you. We were already, it was already on our radar. We already knew that it wasn't good for uh, the beaches from the consensus. I'm not saying everybody, but it's so important that you let your mayors know because I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't, you know, I don't know. I want to make sure that when I go into that chamber, that I'm voting according to your voices. And that is the representation of your uh, your mayors. And I will give it back to you. I'm not going to talk too long. I'm looking at the time. I'm like, oh, Lord. And our friend, Mr. Leo, back there is going to give us the hook if we misbehave. So. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, too, just, just kind of dovetailing off of what uh, Rep. Michael said, uh, and I can attest, too, that uh, Councilwoman Golden was uh, very active at the Capitol uh, during the session over there. And uh, so when we had the vacation rental bill, uh, which ended up dying at the end of session, it didn't pass, which, which was 
good because that's, I think it needs some more work. Uh, but both Rep. Michael and myself were, were voted no because we didn't believe it was best uh, at the time. But uh, literally during the last week of session, which ended earlier this year, the first week of May, um, we had the bill on the floor in the Senate. We had sent it back to the House. It came back. And just, just a little insight into the legislative process, in order for a bill to pass and go to the governor, um, you have to have a bill identical in both chambers. So you could have one start in the House, one start in the Senate. They may start identical or they may not. That's okay. They can start moving in their respective chambers through committees and all. But by the time it gets to the end of the process, one chamber's bill is going to be the one that, uh, that the bodies go with. And one has to say, okay, we're going to send it over this way. They send it to the other chamber. That chamber either agrees or changes it and sends it back. It can only bounce three times. If it bounces, it, well, it can't bounce four times. If there's an attempt to try to do it after the third time, it dies. It can't go anywhere. So there, there is a good force limit to, to force you to work it out if you're going to work it out. So the vacation rental bill uh, was going back and forth, and the chambers were trying to figure out what we're going to do, you know, and all this. And so literally, I'm sitting at my desk. Uh, on my computer, and I'm getting, an e I'm getting some emails from, uh, from Commissioner Golding and Mayor Hoffman, who, who we were engaged with as well, and I'm, I'm literally sitting there writing this, and I wasn't eavesdropping, but my colleague who was running the bill was standing right in front of my desk talking to another member, and I'm hearing everything he's saying, and I'm sitting there typing it, telling them, and they're writing back, hey, ask this, do this, right? <laughs> and so it was, it was really kind of fun, too, but he was literally right there, representation right on the spot. Um, but anyway, uh, all, in all seriousness, we didn't have a good product. I'm thankful that that bill didn't pass. We still have a lot of work to do. I uh, wanted to thank uh, Commissioner, uh, Councilwoman Golding and the other Jack Speech Commissioners and Mayor Hoffman because uh, about a week and a half ago they hosted Representative Michael and myself for a legislative briefing and we uh, delved in pretty deep on each of these topics and a few other items as well. Um, and then you, you saw a few minutes ago the appropriation that we put up that we're going to work on for them. Um, that's a hot topic. We know, we know it works a little differently with Atlantic and Neptune because history there. Um, for Jack's Beach, this is a big issue, and it's a big issue across the state. We need to make sure that we get it right and protect the sanctity of, uh, you know, communities for those who, you know, are here and own their property and live here and deserve to have the peace in the neighborhood and all that, um, and find the right balance with property owners who may want to run out the property. It's their right to do that with their property, but we got to make sure it's balanced right and that the local governments aren't you know, strong health, if that's the right word, hamstrung, I guess you'd say, uh, for being able to enforce the code and, you know, make sure the noise isn't excessive and the property's maintained, you know, just things like that. So we do have some work to do, and uh, we're going to be looking forward to that. And as far as Live Local, just really quick on that, um, that was an initiative that we passed earlier this year. It was pushed uh, hard by our Senate president, Kathleen Casadomo. She's from Naples. Um, a big priority that she had was to uh, try to let people live in the communities in which they work. So, for example, we, we could pull a lot from all over Florida, but this is something I hear from Nassau County a lot, too. We have Fernandina Beach and Amelia. It's beautiful up there. We have that as part of our Senate district. Um, we have a lot of folks who work, say, in hospitality on the island up there. None of them can afford to live anywhere near there. They may have to commute a long way. Um, is there anything, you know, necessarily wrong or immoral about that? No, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, but we have great needs. I just pulled that as, as one of uh, many examples we could use. And we're trying to help folks out there have opportunity to give the local levels more opportunity in their zoning codes and in different things they do. And as far as the developers, giving them tools that they can use to try to uh, put in more affordable housing in a balanced way so that folks can live in the communities that they're working in um, and have more opportunity like that. So that said, there are some tweaks that we need to make in that process because it's not perfect. And so uh, Jack's speech was very helpful to inform us about some of those needs that we have. And we're going to continue to look at that too and uh, find some better balance. And then sovereign immunity, if there are actions that are taken against uh, local governments for, for different issues that could come up. In the case of small cities like Jack's Beach, Neptune, uh, and Atlantic Beach and others across Florida, we have 400 cities and towns across Florida, and those that are smaller could be in a very uh, strapped position financially if different actions come down and there aren't reasonable caps on what the you know, fees or penalties or damages, if you will, could, could be imposed on them are. Uh, so that was one issue that we discussed. And then also, uh, raising some different standards with regard to whatever the negligence level might be, and then some other uh, issues as well, and just kind of finding that balance between the local, state, and federal provisions. I'm trying to enca en encapsulate it the best way possible. Councilwoman, please correct me if I'm if 
if I have uh, misunderstood any of those items. But anyway, we took a lot of notes. Our staff was there with us. We're trying to hear as much as we can before we go back to Tallahassee uh, for session and um, you know, just do our best to represent the needs of the community uh, while we're over there. So that's just a quick uh, recap of those days. Do we have any other Was that thought? Okay. Um, so at this point, I, I know we need to reserve time for Q&A. Brett, did you want to add anything else? Uh, if not, then I, I know we're moving to the next, uh, next portion. Thank you. Very quickly, I want to correct and say, Council Building, because I do respect those titles. Um, and I want to say with the vacation rentals as well, uh, over in the house, part of the battle that uh, we have or the balance that we try to find and why, why there's so much fighting going on is because we have all of these reps who, who are all, we're all looking out for our district. And that is what's significant to us, that's what our party is. And so we had, when it came to the vacation rentals, we had uh, the reps who had um, districts like this one, where all of the coastline areas that were deeply impacted by the vacation rental uh, proposal that they had to build. And it was not, sometimes we can have bills, even, even I will put a bill, I, I put a bill out, and I had to put it on the table. Because sometimes you'll get to work in the bill, and then you realize, no, this is not as good as it can be. And we want to produce a very good product, as the senator was saying. But um, we had all of the, the routes, which I think every one of us, in the uh, house that represented the coastline areas, the inline areas, the beaches, all throughout from the, from the panhandle all the way to the south uh, end of Florida, that were saying um, their mayors or their, their uh, commissioners are saying that that's not a good bill for them. And so that is where I had to just step forward and say, we, we got to come up with something else. As uh, the senator was saying, we don't always get it exactly right. I don't know that we'll ever have a perfect bill, but when it uh, uh, impacts you all to such a degree like that, and I hear that, and you know, in the house we have what we call a bad phone. So right at right at our desk, I have a phone, and when I see the light going off, that's destiny. That's in Tallahassee. That's getting calls from the mayor, who's getting calls from you all. That say, as the senator was saying, don't do this. You know, or, or you know, they're communicating with us. So we are in constant communication. We're hearing feedback. Our ears are tuned, and we are listening to what you all are saying. And these meetings are so important, so thank you. Um, if there was an issue of negligence. And to me, it should not matter 
if someone is 24 or 25. It shouldn't matter if they're married or not, and it shouldn't matter if they have kids who are under the age of 25. But that's what that law says. So if you're the parent of a child who is over, like we have some who I've met and heard from since we've been working on this, we have um, a, uh, a young lady who died in Central Florida earlier this year. She was involved in a bad car accident. She didn't die as a result of the accident, but she had to go to the hospital and she died there. Her mother believes it was as a result of negligence. She had just turned 25 two months prior. She was engaged to be married, but she was not married and she had no children. There was no path to get into court for her mother as a result of that negligence. She'd go for the auto accident, but she can't go for the negligence. Then we have another situation, and some like them, um, another lady who lives over on the west coast of Florida, uh, downstate a little bit, and her father died several years ago, and he was not married. Uh, all of his kids, including her, the one we've heard from, is over the age of 25. And, uh, and so she also does not have a path to go in. So those are the two groups that are barred under this law that's been in place for 33 years now from going to court. So saying I'm not a fan of lawsuits, I'm not, but to me it's a right wrong issue. It really is. And so the past three or four years in the legislature, bills have been filed to outright repeal this law. As a member of the House, two years ago and three years ago, one and two years ago, here we go, 2021 and 2022 session, the bills were voted on by the House. I supported an outright repeal of that law, which I think is not good, but they didn't move in the Senate. Earlier this year, the House or the Senate did not move a bill related to repealing this law. I filed a bill, because they haven't moved before to outright repeal it, I filed a bill that's more of an alternative to have a process in place that can then give you access to court if you go through some review and a, a process by the Department of Health. It's not a perfect product. I've gotten a lot of feedback both ways on this, and I, I welcome any of, if any of you may have any opinion on it. I know I kind of got down in the weeds on a health care issue. Um, but it's just to me the right thing to do. I think we may amend it and find some common ground with it. Uh, but it's very important not only for these families, but really just what do we say as a state about how we value life and what we should do for folks if something bad happens um, in, the, in the care of a health care provider. And I'm getting folks. So anyway, um, so that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, Rep, if you would like to say anything, we'll turn it back over to Ms. Jack. Thank you. You know, I was just talking to uh, last was it last night or night? Days away yeah, from right together. Yeah. yeah, last <laughs> night. I was just talking to a constituent that was talking about the voting issue. And so I'm glad to hear. I didn't know that you were working on that. So thank you so much for that. For me, uh, I have a bill uh, that I put forward. Let me make sure I'm close. And it is for. Um, I basically, to make it short, I want to I want to decrease. I want to stop the uh, street racing that is happening um, because we're seeing it everywhere. It is so dangerous, and I know um, as I'm aging, I'll say that the reactionary time is not the same. And so now we have four people who who are at risk. Not just the person that's driving reckless. The street racing. I know you all have seen that. Some we know where it is, but if you go inland, you you see the street racing. And you've seen them. So I've seen them where they actually stop traffic because they're going around in circles. So um, and nobody can move. And so where that may not be a, a specific issue to just the beaches, I still represent the other side of the intercoastal. And that is happening. It is, it's a big issue and it's something that's dangerous and I want to do something about that. I also have a bill on African American history because I just think I might be the right, the right person. I, I don't know why, I just have that idea that um, may have an interest in that and just making sure we get that right. And um, Senator, I, you know, I think about with you at Nassau County and I'm like, my goodness, what you must be having in Nassau County when it comes to street racing, or are you hearing that? It's got to be. Yeah. Thank you both. We really appreciate it. And um, I've had some people ask um, to do questions, and I want to sort of lay the ground rules. Um, we ask the question of our two people here. Um, we don't make a political speech. We just want the question. So, David, Miron, will you come up, tell them where you live, and then do your question. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Beaches Watch. Thank you, uh, Representative Michael and uh, Senator Yarbrough. So my question, I'm going to ask it twice. It has to do with next week. You're going to Tallahassee, that for a special session. Uh, we understand from the uh, Commissioner of Insurance Regulation, Michael Yuarski. I met with him last week on behalf of Fleet Landing at the Florida Life Care uh, Insti uh, Institute, Flaker, we call it. Anyway, um, the issue really has to do with property insurance. Uh, Fleet Landing, uh, there are uh, close to 600 residents there. The property insurance bill runs $200,000 a month. Uh, we have a surcharge coming up in 2024 of $332 uh, per person a month. You can do the math, 600, 200,000, etc. Until we find better insurance. Now, we brought that to uh, Michael Yuarski last week, and uh, he, he, of course, uh, uh, talked about the benefits of Senate Bill 2A, which of course uh, was passed at the last special session at the end of last year, which uh, mitigates uh, 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 litigation against insurers. That will certainly help uh, bring down cost, and certainly the billion dollars in the reinsurance pool, which of course would help. But he, like the Florida Times Union and the rest of us who look at this, say after 11 months, not much has happened. So we want to know precisely what do you plan to do next week? We're, we understand that lowering the cost of home insurance is on the agenda, even though, as best we can tell, there are no papers written in many of the committees for you to work on. So please tell us what you each will do next week in Tallahassee on this issue. Thank you for the question, and this, uh, this is something also that we touched on a little bit out at Fleet Landing not long ago as well. So, um, so we're a bad problem. That's, that can't be overstated. Uh, the problem that we have, can everybody hear me in the back okay? okay. I'll, I'll stand up just for this, just so everybody can see. Um, so we have a problem that we're dealing with. We did not get into the situation overnight. Um, we won't get out of the situation overnight either, and that's not an excuse for what we've done uh, in Tallahassee, not only through Senate Bill 2A, but also some legislation that we passed prior to that and since then. In this last session, we passed a bill related to uh, more insurer, insurer accountability to go after bad actors. Um, what we have to do is make sure that these policies are being enforced, and it's going to take some time for it to come down to everyone because we can't legislate an overnight fix in this regard. Um, this is something that is impacting everybody, and one thing that we really had to stave off, which we dealt with in some of the bills that you mentioned, was a lot of frivolous lawsuits and actions by those who, we have a lot of great folks in our legal community, but we have a lot who have done some actions that have not helped us out there on the, uh, you know, on the individual basis and on the individual policyholder basis that have driven the costs up. Here's an example. You may have a claim out there, have a case where it's, I won't say that, I won't just chalk it up and rank and file, but you may have a case that's not like an extraordinary type of thing where it's a rare and exceptional circumstance with the claim that you have filed, but yet some out there in the legal community have chosen, even in some of these more routine circumstances, to apply what are called fee multipliers and raise the price up and spend at least bill for inordinate amounts of time that are spent on kind of your regular normal claims, which is helping to drive the cost up even more, instead of reserving that to be more in the rare and exceptional circumstances. So that's one thing that we cut into and said, you can't do that. You can't put fee multipliers on these things and drive the cost up. Another thing that we did is say, the consumers need to have some skin in the game to where, say, like I did when I got home from session this past May, um, somebody knocked on the door right as we had sat down at dinner. He was a young guy, he didn't really know uh, the whole ins and outs, and I didn't give him a hard time, but a young guy from a roofing company. And he said, hey, we got a guy down the street, he can hop up on your roof, he can check it out, we can get you a free roof. I really wanted to tell him who I was and what I knew, but I didn't. I just wanted to hear him talk, because I wanted to see what they're telling everybody firsthand. And he said, just, you know, we can have him come get up there. I said, well, we're good. And he said, uh, we'll get you a free route. If he got five of my neighbors, it would have been a pretty, you know, to, to buy into that, like many folks have. And that was probably a pretty good day for that young man out there walking around from Acme Roofing or whatever company he was with. Um, but anyway, so we have issues like that going on. And you've had this horrible cyclical effect of the, uh, you have the roofing companies out there doing that. You have insurers trying to file legitimate claims or process legitimate claims. 
But then you have attorneys out there trying to, you know, maybe there's the legitimate ones that they're working on, but they're also pushing some that don't really need to be in the system. And so it's been this bad effect that's been affecting everybody. Um, another thing that we decided to do, that was a little more background than was solution, but another thing we tried to do too, and we are seeing more companies come back to the state if you follow the news over the past month or so. Again, it hasn't fixed everything, but citizens can't handle the weight uh, that it's under right now. And it's literally buckling because it was never designed, citizens property insurance, was never designed to hold the load that it has right now because of everything that's going on. And it should never be more competitive than those private insurers out there, those public insurers that will, that will insure folks. And so we had put some limitations on that and said that if a, um, that if a policy offering is within 20%, that someone, or is, is more than 20%, someone has to take the private policy. They can't just keep relying on citizens and keep the load on citizens. It has to be competitive, and we have to attract more companies to the state. And that really, it's a long answer to your question, I apologize. That's really what it's going to take is some more time to get some more insurers to come back in. And we're seeing it it's slow, and it's, it's really impressed me that we've seen six new ones come into the state over the past several months, even though we're still in hurricane season. We're about to come out of it. We're still in hurricane season uh, that, we're, that we're now rolling out of. Um, but it's just going to take some time. So I wish there was a quick fix. Hear it loud and clear. Um, and it's, it's something we've heard from, I think, second only to maybe when we were hearing about the need for unemployment benefits during COVID. Property insurance has been the number one issue I've heard about all seven years that I've been in the legislature. We're trying hard to work on it. You're not looking at an insurance expert, so I lean a lot on those who are more skilled in it. Um, but we are trying. Can. Um, next week, the agenda is limited because of the special session. It's to address some uh, impacts from Hurricane Idalia um, for funding for some of those areas. It's also to address some of the issues related to Israel um, from a state standpoint and a few other things. So we're more limited in our call for the session next week. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to look at this in the, in the regular session that's coming up in January, just around the point. So, Thank you. I wish you had a more promising answer. Um, um, and this Kelly, the Atlantic Beach Commissioner. This is on behalf of nearly all of your constituent cities, especially my fellow uh, beach cities, Neptune Beach, Jacksonville. And when you um, had your, um, your your money, your grants slide up there, the grant for Jacksonville Beach to recycle their water in the golf course is part of it. But we've already cycled water to the golf course, so that's not going to help us. So what we have here is unintended consequences and an unfunded mandate, and that is HB 64. So HB 64 it says all of our treated water needs to re be returned to the, um, to the um, aquifer. Well, it will cost us $30 million to drill enough wells, deep water wells, to dispose of our water that is already clean enough to be discharged back into the St. John's River. So what we need, uh, a couple suggestions that you could do to help all of us out, because you think that if your insurance is high, wait till you get your water bill if we have to pay for this unfunded mandate. The first one is, um, you know, it, it, the, the current deadline is um, 2032. And the, the technology to treat the water as clean as we would want to drink it again is probably not ready for 2032. So we would um, ask that the, the, the legislature consider extending the deadline to give us A, more time to refine the technology, and B, more time to find the money to comply with this. And the second idea is that um, on the, the, legis the legislation, it allows an exemption of municipalities with less than 10 million in revenue. What we request is that it be have an exemption for utility expenditures less than 10 million. And that would automatically um, put us all back in, in the bed. So if you could do one or two of both of those things, that would help everybody that drinks water. <laughs> Um, I'll just say a quick comment to that. So it was uh, Senate Bill 64, that was from 2021, uh, priority of our uh, soon-to-be Senate President Ben Albright, who's from Central, South Central Florida. 
Um, and so a lot of detail in that bill. There were a lot of new regulations that were put in that bill. Um, I uh, was not on the committee that worked on the bill, nor did I run the bill, but happy to look into those items um, and get specifics. There was a lot in that package uh, that was pushed through a couple of years ago. Um, but we made some notes, and we will take that feedback over there and see what we can do. Thanks for bringing it to us. Our engineer is brilliant. Call him up. I love it when you all come with ideas. Thank you so much for that because, you know, we hear the problems, but when you have ideas, it does give us something to work with because we can't think of everything. I mean, and, and I'm new here, but can I still claim I'm new? No, that this is my second one. Okay. <laughs> I, I also want to say when uh, we talk about the insurance rates and when you mentioned the hurricanes, that is such a, it takes such a big chunk out of um, how we're impacted and how you're impacted, how all of us are impacted. But uh, in the House, um, and I believe the Senate as well, I know that uh, the Speaker of the House, Renner, that he uh, established a Hurricane Resiliency Committee. And what that committee will do is focus specifically on uh, the impacts of the hurricane and how we can bounce back even better than what we do. We've been blessed because uh, We've been, our, our governor has had a quick reaction to uh, hurricanes when they hit our, our area and the state of Florida. But I did want to mention that, that just establishing that committee, I know that it's not an immediate fix, as the senator was saying, but it does help us get a better look at um, solutions. And, and if, we can, if we can react better, even in that area, um, then I think it help even the, the challenge that we're having insurance cost and just how it's affecting and impacting all of us. And we do hear you. We're not, we're definitely in tune to what you're saying. Thank you. I mean, please. Just back to property insurance for a minute or two. And I do hear you will wait until the regular session in January. And we do know that We've been educated, a lot of us have been educated as we've gotten our bills, that there are three things that drive it up. First, we know that Florida has 9% of the property insurance claims and 79% of the property insurance lawsuits. So lawsuits are a big deal. We know that hurricanes and storms and everything drive it up. Uh, we know that the cost of construction or reconstruction is driving it up. I went through the law itself and saw all the different changes that have been made both back in December and then through uh, the spring session. And there were a lot of things such as one-way uh, legal fees and a lot of things that did get changed. But there's one thing that was put into the law that was finalized during the spring session and it says that if an insurer <coughs> signs a contract with a lawyer and that contract happens to have a schedule of fees, they will be considered reasonable regardless of what they are. I don't think it said regardless of what they are, but it said it would be reasonable. So to go back and look at the law, the law basically says that if it were more than, there's a disagreement between the assessed value between the insurance company and the insured or whoever is making that assessment. Uh, is, let's say, there's a 51% difference uh, and they decide to settle the claim, you're going to, the lawyer is going to get 100% of whatever was specified in that written contract. There's something wrong with that. It just seems like we're still going down the same way of paying those legal bills. And that's, that seems to be one of our bigger problems in the state of Florida. So I'd ask you to look at that, that part. Thanks. Michael, Michael Phillips. Thank you. So my name is Michael Phillips. I am a, a resident of Neptune Beach. Follow what Council Person Kelly said. Neptune Beach is going to have to spend about $20 million on that same Senate Bill 64. Uh, and I've observed in Tallahassee, I think it was probably about 10 or 15 years ago, 
there seemed to be this shift of, of an attempt in Tallahassee to consolidate all the power there. And I am cautiously optimistic that it appears there's a shift back to local rule. Uh, and I think it's evident in the vacation rental issues and some other things that we're facing. Uh, because this is a very diverse state, it's a large state. The bills that are passed in Tallahassee cannot be a one-size-fits-all bill. It affects these smaller communities, Neptune Beach, Atlantic Beach, a lot more because we just don't have the resources as a smaller city that some of the larger cities do. So my question is, am, am I being too cautiously optimistic or is there a shift in Tallahassee back to local rule? <coughs> Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Um, so I would say, and I, I kind of wear the experience from local government hat and where the state had. I served eight years on the Jacksonville City Council before going to the state house uh, back in 2016, and, and I would say it depends on the issue. And that's not a non-answer. I'll clarify what I mean. So uh, we had a push by a, and I'll, I'll just put on record where I am for this. We voted on it a couple of years ago. I think it was before you came, right, Michael? Uh, we had a city in South Florida that was going so far as to say, we're going to ban the use of any natural gas or propane in our city. Why? We never got an answer why. Just we're going to ban the use. It wasn't a small city. It was a big city. And so we had a bill that ran in Tallahassee. It very quickly picked up steam, no pun intended. And we passed it and said, you cannot. This is not a, a norm, not only a policy direction, but not a not a direction in any way that we want to go to Florida and not give consumers the choice on that uh, use of energy is something that they can utilize, um, which may be the most affordable option or the most energy efficient or whatever they'd like to do. I just use that as one example. Um, so to me, it depends on the issue. That was something that I supported. I probably supported. I don't think we ought to ban the use of that in a, in a city or somewhere in the state. And that, to me, doesn't rise to the level of, well, we should just let that city do it because there are some others across the country who have done that too, and it's caught on more, and that's not something that I believe we should let happen from a from a policy standpoint or as, as the uh, legislature of Florida. So we, we put, a, put a nip in that bud. Um, but as far as other issues of home rule, whether it's what we talked about with issues that can come up under sovereign immunity or other issues like that with vacation rentals where we have to find a balance. Um, we have colleagues that may want to push certain issues and any member is free to file a bill in the House and or the Senate on any issue they would like to file. At the end of the day, it depends a lot on uh, what the what the Speaker, the President, and the Governor might feel about it, whoever's in those roles, not just current leadership. And it also depends on where the majority of the members are because if they hear from members on a given issue that they may not be as passionate about, when I say they, I mean the leadership, if they don't hear a lot from members, they may just let it go through and we'll see what happens. But if it's something they care a lot about or if it's something they are getting a lot of input from members about, then they may get more engaged with it and they may you know, influence that and then, and then we go from there. So really it depends on the issue. Do we always get it right? No. It's a system made of people. People aren't perfect. We're going to have issues that we need to either go back to or that we should change the prior legislature did or even that we did uh, in the past that needs to be corrected in the future. But um, I say all that to say it really depends on the issue. I don't want to put extra burden on local governments, whether it's from a financial or a policy perspective. Um, sometimes when bills come up at the end of the day, it may not be the preference 100% that we may like, um, but a lot of times we find ourselves with bills that may have a number of different things in them. And if you vote yes here, you're it's just like the budget. I don't agree with 100% of priorities in the budget. I'm probably there 90%. And so but if I vote no, I'm voting against the whole budget. So sometimes we're in a position where it may not be an ideal bill, but we'll still support it. Um, but we just we just have to work through you know, those issues. But one last thing, I'm sorry to be so long-winded. Um, whatever the issue is, we need the input. Brett Michael's making that point very well. Um, and I'm not targeting you, I'm just looking your way because you made the comment. Um, but whatever the issue is, we need the input. Um, and that helps us make better decisions and we can confidently go back to leadership and our colleagues in Tallahassee and say, this is what our folks at home are saying. So we, we need that to be back to that. And that is, that's very true because like the vacation rental bill that we had last session, because we had, we had one uh, representative, it would have been a great idea for her district, but then because I was able to hear feedback from uh, from these from you all from your representatives from your mayors, um, I was able to say to go to other representatives who have those inland and those coastline areas 
And we were able to talk together and say, you know what, this is not good for our districts. And then we were able to come together as a consensus, go to that representative that had that, had that bill uh, concerning vacation rentals and say, this is not good for all of our districts. So we were just able to come together. And it gives us a little bit more fighting pushback but it is, it comes back to just hearing from you all. Well, maybe I will squeeze in two more. I think Michelle over there. Was that, was that who that was here? Michelle? Hi. Um, I'm curious what you can do or your plans are to help the city of Jacksonville Beach so have a hand in the vacation rentals. Um, sure. I'd like to know what your plans are in helping the city of Jacksonville Beach have a hand in vacation rentals. For the city of Jacksonville to be able to require registrations, to be able to monitor, um, to really have access into this. Because what it means to the residents, we live west of Pennant. We have two houses directly across the street that are, are, are publicized as 4th of July party, bachelor party, family reunions, weddings. They promote these three-bedroom, four-bedroom house as facilities. We're not on First Street. We're a quiet residential neighborhood, and we need some protection from 80, 90, 80, 90 people coming in on a weekend for events. We have 14 kids in our neighborhood. We have kids on bicycles. Let's, see that day. Let's let the representatives tell us what they can do about it. Sorry, because our time is really over. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know if you, if you were here or slipped in, maybe after we had talked about it just a few minutes ago, but basically, we uh, number one, we, we had a very good meeting with Jacksonville Beach uh, leadership last week, the representative and I did, and we have a number of points that uh, they were telling us about. I also met with uh, Councilwoman Golding and their city manager back in September uh, to talk about it. This is not a new issue. It keeps coming up you know, every year annually. There's a bill filed. Um, and earlier I said, thankfully, the bill from earlier this year didn't file. It didn't pass because we don't think it went far enough to protect the local government's ability to enforce against bad actors or maybe those who don't want to be bad actors, but they're not being thoughtful about the neighborhood. They're being reckless. They're, they're parking everywhere. They're doing all this other stuff. So we need to find the right balance so that the local governments are not having their hands tied where they can't enforce and keep the peace and the sanctity in the neighborhood for everybody else. So we've taken a lot of notes and we've met with them and, um, and, and we're going to be working on that. That's kind of the shortest answer I can give. And Kevin Brown, you had a question. Yeah, you mentioned that, that y'all are going to talk about the Israeli point. Um, I, I just want to say this. I am married to a Palestinian American. We have family in Gaza. And what I hope you do when you go to this session is remind everybody of the innocent ones and ask for ceasefire and ask for... Kevin, this is a... You're, you're getting ask, real political. <laughs> yeah, ask, ask for... I thought you were going to ask about your turtles. I just want to ask you if you do that as a part of your, uh, as part of your thought process. Thank, thank you. you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And thank you... Uh, Congressman, I mean, Congresswoman.